Coming in at number five, we have Titan Triggerfish. These fish are known to be quite aggressive to their prey, and they tend to bite divers who come too close to their nests. These fish are among the largest species of triggerfish, and they are commonly found in lagoons and at reefs deep in the ocean, stretching from Australia to Thailand. Their diet consists of sea urchins, crustaceans, tube worms, and coral. It often feeds by turning over rocks, stirring up sand, and biting off pieces of branching coral. They don't typically feed on other fish, but they've been observed being aggressive and attacking other fish who enter their territory. Along with being aggressive, naturally they get extremely aggressive during the reproduction season when the female is guarding its nest, which is placed in a flat and sandy area, and looks roughly cone shaped. If you dive down and come in contact with the female fish near her nest, it will defend its eggs at all costs, often exposing its erect dorsal spine and swimming rapidly towards you to attack. It is suggested to swim horizontally away from the danger zone rather than than going up to the surface right away. Triggerfish can grow up to 30 inches and their size and oval shape make them very recognizable along with their threatening looking teeth and have evolved as an apex predator within their natural habitat. If you're on vacation and are planning to go scuba diving or snorkeling, be careful not to swim near coral reefs because they tend to swim around there and if you get too close they will attack and bite you. The Titan triggerfish bites are not venomous, they are extremely painful and can cause serious injury. Coming in at number 4 we have flower urchin. Yes it has a nice name, but it is anything but that. It is considered to be the most dangerous urchin in the world. This urchin has flower like patterning and are usually a pinkish white to yellowish white colouring with a central purple dot, and that's how it got its beautiful name. They tend to live in coral reefs, seagrass and sandy environments lower down towards the ocean floor, and it feeds on algae. Bryozones are organic detritus and can grow to a maximum diameter of 15 to 20 centimetres. They reside from Japan all the way to Australia and in the Red Sea to the East African coast. Flower urchins are among the numerous species of sea urchins known as collector urchins, and they often cover their upper body with debris from their surroundings to camouflage from others. They're usually covered in objects like dead coral fragments, shells, seaweeds, and rocks. If you just simply touch this creature, it can deliver excruciatingly painful stings that can result in hospitalization. It can cause paralysis of the tongue, lips, eyes, and muscles, faintness, difficulty breathing, and the inability to speak. A scientist named Sutomu Fujiwara, who was once stung by the flower urchin, described feeling like he was going to die. So when in the ocean, beware of your surroundings and make sure not to touch this urchin. Another account of someone being stung by these dangerous creatures was the drowning of a pearl diver after being rendered unconscious from accidental contact with a flower urchin. Again, if you're going to be swimming, snorkeling, or deep sea diving in the ocean, be very careful you don't come into contact with these beautiful yet dangerous creatures. Come in at number three we have the blue ringed octopus. This creature is beautiful looking and easily recognizable due to their yellow skin and blue and black rings, but it's one of the deadliest species of small octopus in the ocean, and scientists have even classified them as one of the world's most dangerous animals. To the eye, this creature is beautiful, but their blue and black rings around their bodies change dramatically when they become threatened. Despite only being five to eight inches in size, their venom is extremely powerful and can be very dangerous to humans if they're provoked. If stung, it can result in a number of things such as nausea, respiratory arrest, heart failure, blindness, total body paralysis, and can lead to death within a few minutes if not treated or could cause drowning due to the results of the venom, and the inability to swim to the surface. In order to come in contact with the creature's venom, you would have to come into direct contact with the octopus. When faced with danger, the octopus's first instinct is to flee, but if the threat persists, they will then go into a defensive stance and display its blue rings. If the octopus is cornered or touched, the person would be in danger of being bitten and stung by its deadly venom. They are named one of the deadliest sea creatures for a reason, because despite them being such a small animal, they carry enough venom in their bodies to kill up to 26 humans with just a few minutes. Within just a few minutes. These terrifying sea creatures feed crabs, shrimp, and other small animals. They reside in tide pools and coral reefs in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. And their species tend to only live around two to three years, but this may vary based on their nutrition, temperature, and intensity of light. Be extremely careful when in the ocean, be sure to watch out for these terrifying creatures. They would be easy to see due to their bright colours, but if spotted, swim away fast before you get attacked. Coming in at number two, the box jellyfish. 
jellyfish. This is a species of jellyfish that usually tops the list of the most dangerous sea creatures in the world and the world's most venomous creature. At first look its appearance isn't too threatening but if stung it is life threatening. The sting can result in death in less than 5 minutes. The most recent death from a box jellyfish sting was in February 2021 to a man who passed away 10 days after being stung while swimming at Cape York Beach in Australia. Before that the last known fatality was in 2007 and total of 79 deaths since the first report in 1883 and that's just in Australia alone. In the Philippines there are far more fatalities with up to 40 deaths annually. In Thailand after a man died in 2014 from a box jellyfish sting they enhanced their first aid stations on beaches but yet the next year two more fatalities occurred due to this deadly sea creature. Unlike some jellyfish the box jellyfish can swim which means they are capable of hunting for prey and can move through the ocean at a very fast pace of up to 8 miles per hour. They actively hunt their prey which tend to be smaller fish and invertebrates including prawns and bait fish. Unfortunately the box jellyfish has many enemies like crabs, different species of turtles, rabbit fish, bat fish and butterfish but their swift swimming and venomous stings help themselves stay alive. An interesting fact about box jellyfish is that in Hawaii the number of box jellyfish peak after a full moon which is apparently when they come near the shore to spawn. So if you're thinking of going for a swim in the ocean during a beautiful full moon I'd advise to just wait until the next day because you don't want to ruin a nice vacation with a fatal box jellyfish sting. No, no one wants to ruin a vacation by dying. That would suck. And finally, in at number one, we have cone snail. Just by looking at this little snail sitting in its shell, you wouldn't think it would be dangerous or harmful at all. Their shells are beautiful looking with colourful and complex patterns on its shell, but don't be fooled, you should never handle this snail. It is one of the most venomous sea snails in the ocean. There are over 600 species of these cone snails all around the world, and they are extremely toxic. The most dangerous species to humans are the slightly larger ones, but pretty much all cone snails are capable of stinging if handled or stepped on and can be very fatal to humans. Cone snails use a hypodermic needle like modified radula tooth and their toxic venom gland is used to attack and paralyze their prey instantly before eating them. The tooth is hollow and barbed and is attached to the tip of the radula inside the snail's throat. When the snail detects an animal nearby that it wants to feed on, it extends a long flexible tube called a proboscis towards their prey and the radula tooth is loaded with their toxic venom from their venom bulb and is fired into the prey by a powerful muscular contraction. It's like gleeking. They tend to be found in all tropical and subtropical seas in deep areas near rocks and coral reefs. These toxic creatures are carnivorous and predatory and they feed on small bottom dwelling fish, marine worms and even other cone snails. If you're going to swim in the ocean you shouldn't really ever come in contact with these venomous creatures due to them living on the ocean floor. But if they ever wash up on the shore be careful if you're collecting shells from your vacation and make sure you don't pick up any cone shells just in case there's a snail living inside because it could be deadly. Only one drop of their venom can kill up to 20 people. So when swimming in the oceans, be careful and watch out for all these deadly creatures. This is why I never go in the ocean. Everything wants to kill you. Number 5. Dagon and the Deep Ones Coming up first on our list is a multifaceted entry with Dagon and the Deep Ones who worship him. They kind of go together. What is a Deep One? It's not a sea monster that went to first year philosophy and is always trying to wax poetic, but rather a Deep One refers to a race of amphibious, humanoid-like-ish sea creatures closely resembling creatures like frogs or axolotls. If you've ever seen Hellboy's Abe Sapien or the monster from Shape of Water, those monsters are actually a pretty good representation for what a Deep One should look like. Deep Ones get their name from their homes, deep, deep beneath the sea, obviously, where they live out their cold, often miserable lives. When Deep Ones do venture to the surface, they do so to sweep humans under their influence, promising them riches in exchange for warship, sometimes even mating with them, creating disgusting hybrid Deep Ones. And first and foremost, to ingratiate them into the cult of Dagon, worshipping their master, Dagon, a massive, massive Deep One of fantastic power. Dagon appears in the short story appropriately named Dagon, which is also a great jumping on point. If you've ever been curious about reading H.P. Lovecraft and you didn't know where to start, it's one of the first appearances of any of the Lovecraft monsters at all. Dagon is worshipped by humans and Deep Ones in equal measure, no doubt thanks to his influence. Dagon is immortal, massive, and commands a lot of respect. It's unknown what the full extent of Dagon's power is, but Given that he's an immortal sea monster with dominion over a race of pelagic nightmares that do his every bidding, let's assume that if he really wanted to stir up trouble, it would not be that difficult for him. Just ask the town of Innsmouth how they feel about their master. 
that they've got nothing but positive things to say, I'm sure. And hey, while well, I got you here, if you're liking what we do, we'd always appreciate to subscribe our way, and you'll catch the best horror videos in your inbox every single day. Number four, the Shogoths. A Shogoth or a Shogoth, I'm really not sure, which does sound a bit like something a 1920s chimney sweep might yell at you to get off. Hey, Shogoth is a disgusting, writhing mess of iridescent black slime and a sea of eyeballs engineered by the Elder Things to function as a race of tools for their will, as they're mostly used for undersea construction. They're amorphous, shape-shifting monstrosities, able to mock and reflect all matter of organ and life. A Shoggoth is capable of molding itself however it needs to see fit to accomplish its dark dealings, which make them the perfect tools for the Elder Things. Now, The first generation of Shoggoths were brainless husks, solely driven to appease their masters, but over the eons of their existence, the Shoggoths began to mutate and develop a low form of consciousness, eventually rising up and overthrowing the Elder Things altogether and working for themselves to build their own cities, where they now reside in their city in Antarctica, poorly imitating their old masters, shrieking, Tikali, Tikali, over and over, an old rallying cry the Elder Things would shout at the Shoggoths to get them to work. Poor, poor little amorphous shape-shifting monstrosities. Now, although a Shoggoth was intended to serve mostly as a being for construction, they're not without their abilities. A Shoggoth is hulkingly strong, capable of crushing a human in seconds, and they're known for using their brute strength to solve problems in their way. For example, the Shoggoth that makes an appearance in the Mountains of Madness crushes an entire rookery of penguins that was in its way beneath its mighty weight. While the Shoggoths don't seem to have any higher goals or aspirations, they've shown themselves to be threatening enough that if crossed, you'll regret ever dismissing them as nothing more than tools. Number 3. Yugonalak Yugonalak is colloquially known as the Defiler, and is more properly known as the god of depravity and perversion which is just about the worst way you can introduce yourself on a first date. Yugalanak isn't just into human perversions, oh no, no, no. This wretched great one has its sights set on something much bigger than anything our little human brains could conjure up. Yugalanak is after depravity on an incomprehensible scale. That's a word that gets thrown around a lot in the Lovecraft mythos, incomprehensible. Yugalanak's true form is unknown, as it seems to exist in a state outside of a physical body. But when it's looking to pursue some of its disgusting pleasures, it always acquires a human host. And when it takes a human host, it warps its body into a wretched, grotesquely obese form, lacking a head or a neck, and featuring a mouth in the palm of both hands. And I cannot imagine that it is getting up to anything good with those palms. Yugawanak is unlike most other great ones in that it's capable of directly speaking to humans in plain old English instead of indecipherable guttural noises. Its ability to speak English and communicate is what helps it to pursue its dark goals as it seeks out humans who read perverse and forbidden literature and it doesn't just hunt Fifty Shades of Grey fans. It plants seeds of interest in human minds to research and eventually manipulating curious enough humans to read from the Revelation of Glocky a cursed book containing Yugalanak's name. When read, it will be summoned. When Yugalanak is summoned, it makes its guests an offer, offering to make the summoner into a priest of Yugalanak, welcoming them into its service. It's best to accept this gracious offer, as a rejection will offend Yugalanak deeply, leading to the summoner to become its next meal. Unfortunate for you, but either way, Yugalanak is very pleased with the outcome. Either it gets a new servant for its life, or it gets a nice little midday snack. Number 2. Nyarlotep Now, Nyarlotep is one of the most sinister entities in all of the Lovecraft pantheon, and one of the most popular beings as well, appearing across several stories in the universe, both by Lovecraft and other authors over the years. Nyarlotep first appears in the short story, Nyarlotep, which is also another great jumping on point for new Lovecraft fans who want to get into the lore somewhere and don't know where to start. It's pretty self-contained. Nyarlotep is unique in the Pantheon for several reasons, but first and foremost is its freedom. Nyarlotep isn't trapped under the sea or in the stars like Cthulhu or Azathoth, but rather enjoys the freedom of the earth as it wanders. It usually likes taking the form of a man, wandering as a tall, joyous, friendly man, all the better for it to influence people with. It's said that Nyarlotep has thousands upon thousands of forms and manifestations, and we can probably safely assume that most of them are horrifying and sanity destroying. Nyarlotep could actually be described as the most human-like of any of the Elder Gods, which makes it all the more threatening. It's able to sway humans easily, gathering cults of personality around it. 
The original short story in which it appears, Nyarlathotep is gaining influence over the populations by wandering the world, performing incredible miracles, claiming to have lived for 27 centuries, winning over the hearts and minds of legions of followers willing to devote themselves completely for Nyarlathotep's will. Now, Nyarlathotep seems to take a sickening pleasure in driving humans to madness. For Nyarlathotep, death isn't the end game, but manipulating and twisting humans, driving them to insanity, that's the thrill. I guess it gets pretty boring being an unending, uh, unstoppable power beyond the stars. You gotta find something to keep the day exciting, right? Merely being around Nyarlathotep is enough to make a man sick. Nyarlathotep isn't the absolute most powerful entity in the mythos, but it is definitely one of the most nefarious and threatening. Number one, Yog Sothoth. Oh, it, it doesn't even feel good saying that coming out of the throat. I, I shouldn't be talking about stuff like this. This is this is above my pay grade. Yog Sothoth is a horrifying, unfathomably powerful god, and one of the most powerful gods in the whole mythos. If there's one big takeaway from H.P. Lovecraft's mythos, it's that there's always bigger fish up the food chain. We are so insignificant compared to everything else in the cosmos, but we think ourselves so important. We, the beastly fools of mankind, are dwarfed by the radiant greatness of Cthulhu, but Cthulhu himself is dwarfed by creatures like yogg Sophoth. yogg Sophoth, or Yogi, as his close friends like to call him, is the embodiment of all time and space across the multiverse. yogg Sophoth, like most gods in the Lovecraft pantheon, is an indescribable horror beyond human comprehension, and like Nyarlathotep, is known to be able to manifest and take several avatars to better serve its needs. But its most common form is described as that of being a massive, fractally glowing green orbs that continuously merge, separate, and regrow, and an unending, spiraling sea of tentacles, tendrils, and eyes. Yaxothoth sees all. As the manifestation of time and space across the multiverse, there is nothing that can escape its gaze. It's wise to the entirety of all knowledge. It tempts humans by offering to impart that knowledge to those foolish enough to try and take advantage of that offer, who then have their lives utterly destroyed by madness after seeking its favor. The mere sight of Yaxothoth in its natural form is enough to destroy the human brain irreparably. Now yogg Sothoth's goals are just utterly beyond our understanding. It can't even be truly said that yogg Sothoth is evil in the manner we understand. Our ideas of morality and good and evil just wouldn't register to a being like this. We're just too small to even begin to comprehend the horrors of the multiverse. And it's best we don't, because the more you try to study something like this, the more your obsession grows and the more you seal your own fate. Kicking off this list in fifth place, we have the crappiest entry on the list, scientifically known as coprolite. The word coprolite originates from a combination of the Greek words kopros, which means dung, and lithos, meaning rock, with this type of fossils being amongst some of the oldest collected throughout history to gain knowledge of species that came before us humans. The specimens that have been found to date from megalodons are spiral-shaped, indicating that the shark's lower intestines would have been in the shape of a corkscrew, with a spiral external valve similar to lambiform sharks. One specific example found in Beaufort County, South Carolina, measured at least 5 inches in length. And hey, if you're looking for a unique paperweight, you can buy one of your very own in an online auction for under 100 bucks. <laughs> in fourth place, we have the Panama Nurseries. Discovered in 2010 and believed to be 10 million years old, this finding led to the first thorough study of the youngest in the species. Fossil evidence from the area suggests that millions of years ago, the region had shallow shorelines, warm water, and flourishing marine life, which would have made it a perfect place for baby sharks to thrive. Lead author on the project, Catalina Pimiento, has been quoted as stating that scientists were able to interpret the ancient protection strategies used specifically on the fossil record in the area. This discovery was solidified based on an analysis done on a collection of 25 megalodon teeth which were discovered in the same area that were deemed to be too small to belong to fully grown members of the species. Nurseries would provide a safe haven for the baby sharks to grow, shield them from predators, and protect them as they learn to hunt. This practice was not exclusive to the megalodon species, with modern day shark breeds such as cat sharks and great whites adopting similar ways of raising their young. The nurseries would typically be found in warm shallow waters, such as coral reefs and mangroves, places that could offer an abundance of food. This discovery also offers a newer theory as to how the species went extinct over 3 million years ago. With the knowledge that megalodons thrived in warmer temperatures as the climate began to cool around 5 million years ago, it would have reduced the availability of suitable nurseries for the sharks to raise their young. Without good nurseries, baby sharks wouldn't have survived, which may have helped drive the species to extinction. As of 2023, five potential nurseries have been discovered, being in the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Pacific basins, with fossils discovered ranging from 3 to 16 million years ago. Coming in third place, I'd like to discuss what science has been able to establish
much based off of what we know from other sharks. It's believed that megalodons were a robust looking shark and would have had a similar build to the great white shark. The jaws would have been more blunt and wider than the great white. The fins would have also been similar in shape but much thicker due to their size. Its chondrocranium or cartilage based skull would have had a blockier and more robust appearance than that of the great white. It would have had a pig eyed appearance with smaller deep set eyes. The tail fin would have been crescent shaped with a small anal fin and second dorsal fin and there would have been a caudal keel present on either side of the tail fin for stability. Megalodon were officially the largest macro predatory shark that ever lived, reaching upwards of 67 feet in length. In 2020, a 2D model of a roughly 52 foot long megalodon was built to break down the specific measurements of the shark. They would have had a 15.3 feet long head, gill slits that were 4 foot 8 inches long, a 5 foot 4 dorsal fin, 10 foot long pectoral fins, and a 12 foot 8 inch tail fin. In 2022, a 3D model with the same basis as the 2020 study was built, resulting in a body mass estimate of 61.56 metric tons. At this size, they would have needed to consume 98,175 calories per day, 20 times more than what an adult great white male requires. For comparison's sakes, human adults only need around 2,000 calories per day, so imagine the entire population of a town of about 50,000 people being swallowed whole each day. Adult males would have had a body mass of 12.6 to 33.9 metric tons, amateur females would have been around 27.4 to 59.4 metric tons. As with all sharks, their skeletons were made of cartilage rather than bone. Ergo, most fossil specimens are poorly preserved, and that's if they're able to be recovered at all. To support their extremely large teeth, the jaws of the megalodon would have been more massive, stouter, and overall more strongly developed than those of the great white. It's believed that the largest of the species had jaws spanning roughly 6.6 .6 feet across, and scientists have said that they would have been able to open their mouths to a 75 degree angle. With fossils having been discovered around the globe, it's believed that they could tolerate temperatures between 1 to 24 degrees Celsius. Funny enough, same as most of my friends. They inhabited a wide range of marine environments, from shallow coastal waters to areas of coastal upwelling, swampy coastal lagoons, sandy littorals, and offshore deep water environments, along with exhibiting a transient lifestyle. The massive size of megalodons, combined with high speed swimming capacity and powerful jaws, made them an apex predator capable of consuming a broad spectrum of animals, and one of the most impressive predators to ever exist. A study focusing on calcium isotopes of extinct and extant elasmo branch sharks and rays revealed that megalodons were above even the great white shark in the food chain. Fossil evidence indicates that they preyed upon many species, such as dolphins, small whales, shark-toothed dolphins, sperm whales, bowhead whales, seals, sea turtles, and more. Megalodons were an opportunist and privacerous, and would likely have gone after smaller fish and other sharks, with many whale bones having been found with deep gashes likely made by their teeth. Over 75 various excavations have revealed megalodon teeth lying close to the chewed remains of whales and often in direct association with them. In second place, we have some rarer finds, actual vertebrae. The most notable example is a partially preserved vertebral column of a single specimen, excavated in the Antwerp Basin in Belgium back in 1926. It's made up of 150 vertebral centra, with the centra ranging from 2.2 to 6 inches in diameter. The shark's vertebrae may have gotten much bigger, and scrutiny of the specimen revealed that it had a higher vertebral count than specimens of any known shark, possibly over 200 centra, only the great white approaching it in count. Matthew Bonin, professor of biology at Stockton University, was a co-author on a paper detailing one megalodon shark's story and its dark secret revealing how it grew to be so large before birth. Bonner read the CT scans of three of the fossil vertebrae from this grouping, believing this megalodon to have passed 15 million years ago. The story they told was that the shark likely ate a sibling while still in its mother's uterus. It was born at 2 meters long, lived 46 years, and reached a maximum length of around 30 feet. Another partially preserved vertebral column of a megalodon was excavated from the Graham Formation in Denmark in 1983 and is made up of 20 vertebral centra, with the centra ranging from 4 to 9 inches in diameter. Shark vertebrae are made up of calcified cartilage, which is not the rubbery cartilage at the end of your nose or in your ears, but instead a special type of cartilage that has minerals in it, so it's more likely to be preserved, which is why they were able to be fossilized. In our first place, the moment you've all been waiting for, the teeth. Seeing as the literal definition of megalodon is big tooth, how could that be anywhere on this list other than the number one spot? Megalodons had four kinds of teeth in their jaws, anterior, intermediate, lateral, and posterior. Their front teeth are fairly symmetrical and do not point messially, so the side of the tooth towards the midline of the jaws where the left and right jaws meet. Diagnostic characteristics of the teeth include a triangular shape, powerful structure, large size, fine serrations, a lack of lateral denticles, and a visible V-shaped neck, which is where the root would meet the crown. 
with the teeth meeting the jaw at a steep angle, similar once again to, you guessed it, the great white shark. The tooth was anchored by connective tissue fibers, and the roughness of the base would have added to mechanical strength. The lingual side of the tooth, which would have faced the tongue, was convex, and the other side of that tooth, known as the labial side, was slightly convex or flat. The interior teeth were almost perpendicular to the jaw and symmetrical, whereas the posterior teeth were slanted and asymmetrical. Megalodon teeth can measure over several inches in slant height, so diagonal length, and are the largest of any known shark species, reminding us once again that they were the largest of all macropredatory sharks. In 1989, a nearly complete set of megalodon teeth were discovered in Saitama, Japan. Another nearly complete associated megalodon dentition was excavated from the Yorktown formations in the United States and served as the basis of a jaw reconstruction of a megalodon at the National Museum of Natural History. Based on these discoveries, an artificial dental formula was put together in 1996 to help with building recreations and estimating the overall size of these massive beings. I'd quote it here, but I promise y'all don't want me repeating mathematical equations I don't understand. Just ask my high school math teachers if you don't believe me. <laughs> they had over 250 teeth in their jaws, which were spread out over five rows. A single row is estimated to have been made up of 46 front teeth. A single row is estimated to have been made up of 46 front row teeth, 24 in the upper jaw, and 22 in the lower jaw. The reason so many teeth have been recovered is because, like all sharks, they would replace their teeth as they grew or as the teeth became worn or damaged. New teeth are continually grown in a groove in the shark's mouth, and the skin acts as a conveyor belt to move the teeth forward into new positions. Younger sharks would place their teeth more often than older ones, similar to most other beings. We don't have exact data on the rate teeth would have been replaced just yet, we can safely assume that an adult megalodon would have shed thousands of teeth in its lifetime. The teeth were also serrated, which would have improved efficiency in cutting through flesh or bone. Megalodon teeth are the most common fossil found from the species and can be easily acquired for your personal collection. Prices range from $12 to over several thousand dollars in online auctions. Number five, SCP-1128. Number five on our list, 1128, is a terrifying entity that manifests itself as a colossal aquatic predator. It's sometimes described as a being similar to a shark, only in a more grotesque and twisted appearance, with common descriptions across all sightings being a mouth full of teeth. The entity manifests itself as an aquatic predator to anyone who is given a full description of the beast's appearance, either through a written description or a spoken description, so... Sorry. Sorry for describing it. Few surviving subjects have described it as resembling a massive monstrous deformed shark. Once a subject is exposed to detailed knowledge of 1128, they become infected by its latent psychic ability, forming a connection. From here, no immediate abnormal changes in behavior or occurrences are present, with the only notable variance being a hesitation to enter bodies of water. For good reason, too. Once an exposed subject submerges themselves completely in water, they are caught by 1128. Any submerged water is enough. Subjects are taken mysteriously to an ocean, the location of which is redacted by the Foundation. From here, you are hunted by SCP-1128. The Foundation patrols this unmarked ocean in a desperate attempt to contain the creature and protect anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in its trap. It's difficult to interview subjects after an exposure, as any detailed description of the encounter does run the risk of contaminating more Foundation members. Should a member or subject become infected by SCP-1128, treatment is immediately advised, with Class C amnesiacs being used to try and block memory of the entity. So, maybe for your sake and my sake, try to to forget number five entirely for your own safety. Now the foundation does advise that if you've been enjoying the content that we produce, you should toss a subscribe our way. Number four, SCP-1451. SCP-1451 is an odd one even by foundation standards. SCP-1451 presents itself as a set of 26 metal statues at the bottom of the ocean. All appear to be statues of children of varying heights. The statues are all standing in a circle, holding each other's hands and facing outwards in a ring formation. Should any object, living or otherwise, with a mask greater than 40 gram enter into the ring, SCP-1451 begins to animate. The statues will shift themselves in a counterclockwise movement. Their hands will raise and lower slightly, and bubbles can be seen protruding from their mouths. Once it becomes fully animated, SCP-1451 displays advanced strength and tactics, being reported to use various martial arts to dispatch targets, pressure point application on humans, and precise strikes on machinery. They move in perfect unison and coordination, with some speculation that they operate on some level of hive mind mentality across the 26 individual entities. Once SCP-1451 has begun its hunt, it will not rest until it is disposed of whatever invaded its territory. The Foundation refers to three states of SCP-1451. Class 1 is the initial ring of statues in its inert state, Class 2 is the slight animation and bubbling seen present, and a Class 3 situation is when an active hunt has begun. To try and prevent a Class 3 situation, the SCP Foundation has installed a sphere of wire mesh netting to ensure nothing too large enters the ring. Natural water currents and oceanic movement aren't to be obstructed 
corrupted. The creature does need to eat sometimes. Number 3, SCP-835. SCP-835 manifests itself as a large cluster of polyps resembling a species of coral, although it's significantly larger than any discovered species of coral. The center mass of the cluster is a very large oval with 3 meter long polyps at each end. SCP-835 does not move, instead anchoring itself to the ocean floor using heaving tentacles that protrude from the polyps. The tentacles are coated in an adhesive substance and have been shown to be incredibly strong, capable of damaging bulkheads and steel. The coral base of SCP-835 is extremely durable and resistant to most attempts to collect any tissue samples, with the foundation having to use high powered diamond drill bits to collect even small samples of DNA. SCP-835 emits a large mass of semi-liquid material several times a day from each polyp. The toxic substance appears to be a mixture of digested solids, fecal matters, several bacteria, viruses, and parasites, with many sequences having originated only from 835. So what exactly makes SCP-835 so threatening? Well, sample reports from SCP-835 have shown that it's comprised almost exclusively of human DNA. Its hard shell seems to be recycled tooth enamel, its tentacles matching human flesh. A level 4 clearance declassified document from the Foundation detailed an encounter with an underwater isolation team, in which an incident in which two members of the isolation team were swallowed by SCP-835, pulled in by its tentacles deep underneath what they had initially thought to be a cave, but realized was the contents of SCP-835's stomach. The crew members reported descending deeper and deeper, spending up to 72 hours inside the creature's digestive tract, the insides of its intestines lined with remnants of unfortunate victims, claiming that they had been morphed into flesh and there was a wall of faces crying for release. Eventually, one of the crew members was released, though after significant breaches to its suit, Unfortunately, he had to be let go from the Foundation. We thank him for his service. Number 2. SCP-1092 SCP-1092 presents itself as a class of Astyachthys fish, and when the creature is matured, it resembles any number of other ocean-dwelling fish, with the only notable variance being its increased aggressive behavior, attacking prey. It's difficult for the Foundation to study, as only adult specimens can be studied, as in its juvenile phase, SCP-1092 are parasites birthed from a living host. Once SCP-1092 infects the blood stream of its host, absorbing nutrients directly from the host's blood. Once exposed, the parasites initially are but a few millimeters in most its size, but grow many times their size, with the largest extracted one on record being 2.1 centimeters. There is insufficient data on how SCP-1092 infects its hosts. The current research data theorizes that minuscule eggs makes its way into the body through small cuts and scrapes, which would explain the fish's violent tendencies. Those infected by SCP-1092 report fatigue, weight loss, and increased appetite and in many cases report a feeling of something fluttering or squirming inside the body. However, this is not present in all cases, as there are reported case files of hosts not experiencing any visible symptoms whatsoever until the parasite has unfortunately matured to its adult aquatic stage. Once the parasites have matured, the now adolescent creature will try to forcibly remove themselves from the physical body of their host, using their sharp teeth to cut through blood vessels and skin. Subjects at this stage will sustain injuries, severe blood loss, and in some cases worse. Thankfully, the SCP Foundation has effectively secured SCP-1092, keeping it housed in a completely watertight cell where it is given the occasional domestic pig to act as a host for its reproductive cycle. Poor little piggy. Thank you, piggy. Thank you, Foundation. Number 1. SCP-3000 SCP-3000 is one of the most powerful SCPs currently being monitored by the Foundation. SCP-3000 is a Class 8 cognitohazardous entity and is a Level 5 classified document. I really shouldn't even be talking to you about this, but it's good to get this information out there. It is a massive, massive aquatic sea serpent that closely resembles a moray eel, only gigantic. There's been significant difficulty in efforts in trying to document its true size, but it is estimated to be anywhere between between 600 and 900 kilometers in length, with its head measuring roughly 2.5 meters wide and its body as large as 10 meters in diameter. SCP-3000, thankfully, is typically a sedentary creature, not moving much at all, usually only responding to feeding. The majority of its body rarely moves. SCP-3000 has been known to be carnivorous, and when it hunts, it has been known to move exceedingly quickly. Fascinatingly, despite its gargantuan size, SCP-3000 does not appear to need sustenance to maintain its body's function, and thus its digestive process is unknown. Although complicating matters slightly is a process wherein SCP-3000 disperses a thin layer of viscous dark gray sludge through its skin whilst it consumes its prey. It doesn't stop there though. SCP-3000 has been recognized to cause severe mental damage in those who research it. Direct observation and study has been proven to cause mental alteration in Foundation researchers, experiencing paranoia, fear, 
anxiety, memory loss, and most worryingly, inexplicable severe headaches. It's unknown how SCP-3000 causes this, but the theories are that it has a latent psychic ability. There are some who believe SCP-3000 could be an old god that has found its way into our world. The creature is too immense to be contained in any foundation facility, instead being kept in a clandestine area of the Bay of Bengal, in an area barred from the public, routinely patrolled and surrounded by foundation vessels. Be extremely thankful that the brave members of the foundation are researching and containing this. Secure, contain, protect. Those are the goals of the foundation. Number 5. The Kraken. Over the port side, boy! Starship blows! Butter down the hatches! The Kraken's there! I'm sorry, I absolutely could not resist. I'm just trying to paint you a picture of the scene here. The Kraken is an absolutely legendary sea monster, harking back to old sailors' tales from the 17th century. It started as an old Nordic legend and was said to haunt the waters from Norway through Iceland. But as its legend grew, stories of the Kraken would be passed throughout the world carrying on from sea to shining sea. It's widely theorized that the legend of the Kraken began with sightings of the colossal squid, a creature almost as mythical as the Kraken itself. An old fisherman's tale, it's depicted as a colossal cephalopod, capable of crushing a fully stacked galleon with its tentacles and bringing it down to the ocean floor. If the tentacles and its heaving beak aren't enough, it also creates whirlpools around it, as it drags your doomed ship down with it all the way down to Davy Jones's locker. The Kraken probably has one of the best PR agents in the sea monster community, being the subject of stories, songs for centuries, finding its way into numerous movies, a career making role in Clash of the Titans, a very strong supporting role in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise really helped elevate it to stardom, even finding its way into a bunch of video games over the years, serving as a boss for players in God of War, Sea of Thieves, and for the real OGs out there, RuneScape as well. When it comes down to who could defeat who, it's not even a question. The Megalodon wouldn't get so much as 30 seconds with the Kraken. The Kraken of lore was crushing ships in seconds. You think it's even gonna notice crushing a shark? Number four, the Loch Ness Monster. Now, the Loch Ness Monster is probably the most famous sea creature of all time, and probably one of the most famous Scottish things of all time, alongside William Wallace, Kilts, and Haggis. It's also one of the world's oldest recurring cryptid stories, with the first reports of Nessie going all the way back to the year 565. And since then, Nessie has delighted cryptozoologists the world over, becoming a cultural icon for Scotland and the Loch Ness as a whole. There's been several, several concentrated efforts to really find the Loch Ness Monster over the years. And while nothing has ever officially shown up on a sonar or a radar, that has never stopped the stream of sightings and photos of the Loch's gentle giant. Nessie seems pretty benevolent. There's never been a story or an allegation of the Loch Ness Monster eating or hurting anyone, usually just sticking its cute little head out of the water for a quick little blurry candid to be discussed and analyzed for years. Let's talk serious for a second here. In the ring, squaring up in a 1v1, I've absolutely got Nessie over the Megalodon, easy. That long neck is gonna wrap around the Meg, get that thing lassoed. You know, the Meg is big, sure. But the Loch Ness Monster clearly has some stealth capabilities. I mean, it's been eluding capture for the better part of 1,500 years, so I've got to imagine that Nessie's got to know some pretty good tricks for hiding. But more so than anything, Nessie's got the people of Scotland riding for them. You're not just messing with a sea creature Megalodon, you're messing with a beloved cultural icon. It would be like going to war against raccoons in Toronto. The people just won't stand for it. Number three, Umbozu, translating to sea priest, is a yokai appearing in Japanese folklore. It's depicted as a large, shadowy figure looming out of the water, appearing to sailors, breaking the ship as it rises, and demanding a bucket from whatever unlucky sailor happens to cross its path. Maybe it's got a leak in the roof. There's some differing opinions on what the origin of the Umubozu is, as there's no specific origin to its legacy or one tale we can point towards. But it's generally agreed that the origin is that they are the spirits of priests who were thrown into the ocean by villagers for one reason or another, and because these priests have had nowhere to lay their bodies to rest, their spirits inhabit the ocean and take the form of a dark specter, haunting and taking retribution on unfortunate souls in the waters. I'd never heard about this creature until researching it for this video, and I've got to say it has got some fantastic folklore. You really should do yourself a favor and look up Umabozu after. The Umabozu rising from the sea and asking if you've got a bucket for it is hilarious. Like it's more of an annoying roommate than a sea monster asking if it can borrow something. Folklore says the Umabozu would cling onto the hull of the ship and shriek at the sailors, sinking them down. The Umabozu's weakness? The smell of smoke, apparently. So if you're looking to get rid of one, light some sage up, I guess, or light something. I'm sure that's very easy to do when you're on a wooden boat in the water. Now, squaring up against the Megalodon, 
this one, I actually do feel like it could go either way. The Megalodon, Giant Shark, Umabozu, Scary Spectre. But I am going to give the edge to Umabozu solely because I don't know if it's got an actual tangible physical form or if it's just a shadow monster. You know, Megalodon can't really bite through shadows, I don't think. I don't think that's one of its powers. As well, I could really see Umabozu pulling that little trick, you know, hanging on to the side of the Meg, asking for a bucket, and then the Megalodon, who presumably doesn't speak any languages, not understanding what's happening, gets dragged down to the bottom of the sea, never to be seen again. Number 2, Skyla and Carabitus. Skyla and Carabitus are sort of like a wrestling tag team duo as far as mythical sea monsters go. They worked in tandem, hounding opposite sides of a narrow strait of water, and famously clashed with the Argo Odysseus, made famous in Homer's Odyssey. The first beast, Skyla, was described to be a dragon-like creature, having 12 feet, 6 long necks, and atop each neck was a head full of razor sharp teeth. Sailors unlucky enough to pass through Skyla's territory were swooped from their vessel and swallowed hole before they'd even know what would happen. That doesn't sound so bad, you know, all in an instant. There's some speculation that perhaps the original Skyla was a very dramatized account of sailing through an underwater reef, which would definitely provide some explanation as to why a writhing mass of limbs and teeth would be shredding through a ship's hull. But Skyla is only one half of this dynamic duo, the Robin to Batman, and the other half is Carabitus. Carabitus is a little harder to describe, as it has no agreed appearance. In the original myth, The Odyssey, Carabitus presents itself as a whirlpool, savagely swirling around, creating the tides and pulling passing ships into their doom. Maybe it's just a little camera shy and it lets its more handsome sibling take a lot of the front facing business. However, of the two, it could be argued that Carabitus was the more dangerous of the two, as during the Odyssey, Odysseus chose to sail his ship closer to Skyla than Carabitus, figuring that it was wiser to lose six men to lose the entire ship. Very wise guy. Now, the Megalodon. Drop out of this one before you even try. A one on one is one thing, but a duo battle against a whirlpool and a six headed dragon? Save yourself the embarrassment and just clock out and go home. Number 1, Jormagander. Jormagander is another old Nordic sea legend, also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent, and is a serpent so large that its tail would surround the circumference of the earth and all its oceans and loop back around onto itself inside its mouth creating an Ouroboros. This impressive girth is where the creature gets its name, World Serpent. Jormagander's also had a bit of a star-studded run in pop culture, appearing in Marvel Comics and most recently the new God of War based around Nordic legends. Jormagander is fairly central to Nordic mythology, as it was said that when the creature would stop biting its own tail and release it from its jaws, it would be one of the signs of Ragnarok, and the creature would thrash its tail and the seas would rise up and flood Midgard, the Nordic term for their realm. There are several notable myths detailing Thor's many encounters with Jormagander, and his various attempts to overpower the beast and to slay the mighty serpent, although as the myths go, he was never quite successful. Good for me, because I actually don't think I would do too great in Ragnarok. I'm really not much of a fighter, and I don't think I would do well wrestling any Vikings. It's said that when Ragnarok occurs, Thor will slay the mighty serpent, only to find himself defeated by poison from the creature himself. All of this to say is that as far as sea monsters go, there could not possibly be anyone more powerful in lore than Jormagander. All this beast has to do to initiate the end of the world is to take its tail out of its mouth. The Megalodon wouldn't be able to challenge this thing. It would literally be over before it began. The Jormagander opens its mouth to start the duel and that's it. It's done. Not only is the Megalon done, but everything's done. Seas flooding, fires raining down from the heavens. How could there possibly be a more powerful sea monster than this? Unless they update the Nordic myths at all, I doubt anything will ever top the legend of the Jormagander. Number 5 on this list is Sinkhole Sam. The legend of Sinkhole Sam originated many years ago in Kansas. Sinkhole Sam is said to live in Inman Lake, or as the locals call it, the Sinkhole. It's believed to be a 15 foot long serpent like creature that is as round, and I quote, as an automobile tire. The people who claim that this serpent was 15 feet and round like an automobile tire are Albert Newfield and George Rager, two witnesses of the beast. These men are some of the many people who have stumbled upon this creature and have spoken out about it. Based on the reports, people believe that Sinkhole Sam is a type of prehistoric serpent that has managed to survive over the years. Now back before Kansas was even colonized, there were lakes and rivers all over the terrain making it a perfect spot for an animal like this to survive. As time went on, the area dried up and locals believe that Sinkhole Sam took up residence in Inman Lake. As the years have passed though, the sightings of Sam at Inman Lake have been fewer and farther between. However, the sightings of a similar creature at the Kingman State Lake have grown. This led
Lake isn't too far from Inman Lake either, only 50 miles. 50 miles is certainly a long distance to go, but maybe not for a massive serpent like Sam. Single Sam, in my opinion, is one of the most likely creatures to actually exist. Unlike other sea beasts that are very far from any living animals that we have in our world, Single Sam, from most accounts, is just a big snake. I think it's super possible that someone has spotted a massive snake over the years in that lake, and through word of mouth, the story has been exaggerated over the time to become the legend of Single Sam. Now, if Sam is real, then we should all be in the clear because even though a 15 foot serpent may be terrifying, there have been no reported attacks from Single Sam on humans since the legend began. Number four on this list is Leviathan Melville. This ancient beast is aptly named after the Leviathan due to its incredible size. This is a monstrous whale that grew from 45 feet to 60 feet in length. It has the largest teeth from any animal used to eat the world has ever seen, reaching a length of 1.18 feet. Their heads were 10 feet long and their jaws were absolutely massive. Similar to Megalodon, these creatures are long extinct and lived roughly 12 million years ago. Also similarly to Megalodon, they had the exact same diet as the massive shark, whales. That's right guys, this massive whale ate other smaller whales. Also because it was competing for the same food source as Megalodon, it's not unrealistic to think that those two creatures would have fought several times. And before I go any further about this beast, comment down below who you have in a fight, Megalodon or this leviathan of whales? I want to know who you guys got. Anyways, over the years we've seen many legends about massive whales that were extremely aggressive. Moby Dick is one of the most famous stories of all time and features a massive of whale. This creature, however, would have put Moby Dick to shame and potentially would have even had it for lunch. Also, after it was finished eating Moby Dick, it would have happily eaten Captain Ahab and completely demolished his whaling ship. A lot of other entries on this list have had some reported sightings and witnesses, but this one we have real fossils to prove its actual existence. I've personally always been a fan of whales. In fact, an orca whale is my favorite animal in the whole world, but making an orca whale 60 feet with massive teeth is what we have here. And and that might be a bit too much for me if I'm being honest. Number three on this list is Ninjin. Ninjin are very strange mythical creatures that have only come into the limelight very recently. The rumors and legends of these creatures have largely taken place in Japan. Japanese whale research boats that are sent to the Arctic waters have reported seeing these massive 20 to 30 meter long creatures that are completely white swimming through the ocean. Now when I first heard that I thought that these things might just be big whales, but their shape is unlike anything that we've ever seen before. These creatures are said to look almost human, with witnesses saying that they saw massive legs and arms coming from the beast. They also have eyes and a mouth, but not many other facial features from the reports. For just over the last decade, stories about Ninjin in the Antarctic waters have circulated throughout Japan. One of the most famous was when crew members on the deck of a ship saw what they thought was a submarine in the distance, but when they approached it, realized the creature was alive and watched as it dived quickly underwater. There are some photos that have surfaced on the internet, but nothing that can fully substantiate the claims of this creature's existence. It is also currently unknown if there's only one of these creatures or if there are several of them swimming around the seas. This beast, unlike some of the other creatures that we've talked about is not just a bigger version of an already existing animal. It isn't just a big snake or a big shark, it's a completely different entity entirely. This makes me think that it would be harder for somebody to confuse a big whale with a creature like this because a whale doesn't look anything like a ninja. Hopefully more sightings and evidence can come to light soon and we can get a definitive confirmation if this thing is real or not. Number two on this list is the Oklahoma octopus. This mythical octopus is said to inhabit some of the bigger lakes in Oklahoma like Lake Thunderbird, Ulaga Lake, and Lake Ten Killer. The sightings indicate that this is a very large, aggressive octopus that we wouldn't want to mess with. Many deaths in these lakes have been linked to this octopus, or octopi if there are multiple of them. What's very strange about this creature and what makes a lot of people skeptical is that typically octopi don't live in freshwater areas. They're capable of doing it for a short time, but they never live there for extended periods. That being said, there have still been multiple sightings and reports of this creature living in these lakes. It's said to be the size of a horse and has a reddish brownish skin tone to it. It eats what any other octopus would eat, but has a tendency to kill humans in its area. The reasoning behind this is unknown though, because it doesn't actually eat the humans, but only drowns them. Potentially the octopus feels threatened by humans swimming in its water and is very territorial. There's no physical evidence proving the existence of this creature, but the rate of drownings in these three lakes that I mentioned earlier, they're far higher than anywhere else in the area. That statistic, along with the numerous 
sightings from fishermen and swimmers have locals believing in the legend of the Oklahoma octopus. Number one on this list is Organism 46B. Organism 46B is believed to be a massive 33 foot long squid like creature that was said to have 14 different tentacles. This thing lived in Vostok Lake, which is a subglacial lake located under two entire miles of ice. This creature has the ability to animate its legs after they've been amputated. It's capable of shape shifting. It's extremely intelligent and also extremely hostile. And it has the ability to immobilize its prey with a toxin that it could spray up to 150 feet. We've only actually known about this creature for a few years. Although the Russians initially established an Antarctic base on top of Vostok Lake in 1957, they actually weren't aware that there was a lake beneath them until 1974, and then they weren't able to get to the lake until 2012. It was only after that that they discovered Organism 46B. After they drilled all the way through the ice and got to a point where they could send divers down there, they discovered this creature. Sadly, the discovery was a deadly one though. Dr. Anton Padalka, a researcher at the site, is quoted saying, he tread water wearing a blissful smile as the organism approached him. We watched helplessly as it used its arms to tear off its head, then popped its remains in its mouth. It was as if it had hypnotized him telepathically. This ability to completely lull its prey into a sense of is apparently what this creature's venomous spray is capable of doing to people. Padalka had some more interactions with this beast, but it didn't take long before the Russian government came into the mix and sent a specialized team into Vostok Lake to extract the organism. The fact that any of this news even made it to the public is pretty marvelous, considering the Russian government wanted to keep it under wraps as much as they could. Hopefully, there aren't any more of these dangerous beasts lurking in the subglacial waters waiting to strike. Number five, the frilled shark. Chlamydoslacus ingenius and Chlamydoslacus africana, or better known as the frilled shark, and the frilled South African shark are the two extinct species of shark that swam our oceans. Thank gosh. Well, actually, still kind of do. Eh. The frilled shark is considered a living fossil. Not just its age and time spent surfing the coast, due to its primitive eel-like physical trait, the brown color, the jaws, eight foot body, and the way its fins, spine, and head move under the water are common in ancient serpents and water creatures. So this thing is like an eel-serpent-shark hybrid. Yeah, little jarring. Commonly referred to simply as the frilled shark because of its six pairs of gill slits at its throat. It swims amongst the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, usually in deep, dark, murky waters of the outer continental shelf and upper continental slope. These deep dive sharks usually live and sleep near the ocean floor. Okay, that's, that's a good sign, of course. They live on a diet of cephalopods, smaller sharks, and even swim to the surface at night to feed what's floating atop on the surface. When hunting, the frilled shark moves like an eel, bending and slithering to swallow prey with its long and flexible jaws, which are equipped with 300 rows of recurved needle-like teeth. So am I just gonna like snorkel into one of these things any day now? Well, good thing is they're really hard to find. Like, really hard. Usually caught by accident in commercial fishing nets, usually at depths anywhere between 50 and 1,000 meters. So unless you're free diving at night, you should be okay. Yeah, they like it deep and dark. I'd say these things are already scarier than the Meg. It's like a shark, but an eel-snake hybrid with a shark head and shark size teeth. That sounds a bit scarier. Well, I mean, the Meg preferred warmer, shallower water, so maybe this one's a tie. I don't know who's snorkeling two miles deep, but it's certainly not me, okay? In my opinion, I'd take a large great white over this dinosaur-looking thing slithering after me any day. Number four, the fang-toothed fish. Ah, yes, the Anoplogaster cornuta, or commonly known as the fang tooth. I wonder why. Though they spend most of their time in the deep, deep, common fang tooths are known to migrate towards the surface at night. Sorry, the fang tooths are known to migrate towards the surface at night. That is the scariest sentence I've ever said. Dude, these are way scarier than this giant ancient shark. Like all the scariest things come out at night. You notice that? And root canals, but they're usually done during the day. The word megalodon is Greek words meaning giant tooth. I'd take big teeth over this thing chasing me around any day. Thankfully though, this guy is only about a foot in length. Okay, that's not so bad. The fish has a mouth that are full of long snake teeth, perfect for hanging onto its prey as they shake. The lockable jaws ensure that although thrashing may occur, the fang tooth's teeth are locked clamps that effortlessly swim with dinner in its mouth, just getting dragged deeper and deeper down, wiggling and can't move, trying to run for their lives. Well, swim for their lives. And fish of any size. I'm sorry? Yep any size. Common fang tooths have been recorded at depths of about 5,000 meters, so whatever lives down there, it's game on. Look at this thing. I was scared of sunfish and seaweed brushing up against my legs. 
This thing's swimming by me? This thing? It looks like a night terror in itself. Stalking their preferred prey of crustaceans and of course, other fish is the same size. Common fang tooths are more active than many other deep sea fish and seek out food for meal and sport rather than being purely ambush predators eating when they're hungry. That's terrifying. Packing up for the long winter, huh? Their huge mouth and very long teeth ensure that they are able to attack prey and actually hold on while they relocate them to a deeper, darker spot where they can kind of take their time on the meal. I've swam with sharks. In my opinion, this thing's way scarier. Like eating small critters running around the ocean floor, sure. But also imagine eating something the same size of itself with teeth, no problem. Slowly devouring it bite by bite. Yeah, that's way scarier, come on. Just reattaching itself every bite, taking you along for the free ride. Yeah, that's, that's, that's horrifying. And number three, the big fin squid. Of the genus Magnapinidae family, the big fin squid, or as I like to call it, this ocean alien with shoulders, belongs to a group of rarely seen cephalopods with a distinctive morphology, meaning they're really, really weird and rare. Magnapinidae, meaning big fin, of course. The first record of us catching and looking at this family comes from a specimen talismani caught off the Azores in 1907. This was our first look at this bizarre fish, but due to the damaged nature of the find, little information could be extracted and was classified just as a squid. The problem is when you pull these things out of its atmosphere, it just looks like a piece of wet crinoline dress all of a sudden. Don't get the whole terrifying effect, you know? In 1956, a similar squid was caught in the South Atlantic, but during the 80s, two specimens were found in the Atlantic, then three more were found in the Pacific, and eventually the creatures found a place amongst the books as its own species, entering the family Magnapinidae. Squids. Okay, so it's not actually a squid, but loosely related. Like a third cousin of maybe alien origin. This thing looks like it crashed here on an asteroid. I'm just gonna say it, doesn't it? Like there's only 12 of these, not many. The arms and tentacles are the same length. The appendages are also huge and held perpendicular to the body, creating the appearance of a illusion of arms and elbows, giving its trademark alien figure. Most remarkable is the length of the elastic tentacles, which has been estimated around 20 to 30 times its mass and length. Deep sea video evidence puts the total length of the largest specimens at 10 meters long. Yeah, that's two trucks. Close-ups of the body and head show us that the fins are extremely large, being proportionately nearly as big as those of a big fin squid. Hence, the comparison. While they do appear similar, no specimens or samples of the adults have been taken out of the water yet, leaving their exact identity, bodily functions, and internal organs a mystery. Awesome. Yes, more mysteries under the water. All right, I only had uh, really bad night terrors already. Let's just add this in there. Yeah, I'd take a shark swimming with a brain at me rather than this alien thing swimming up to me and just staring at me, trying to understand me for about an hour. Terrifying. Number two, the gulper eel. Uripharynx pelicanoides. The pelican eel, or what I just said, is basically a deep sea eel. Like, deep, deep sea. If you've seen the Ridley Scott's Alien film franchise or the Predator universe, you'll know that this thing looks exactly like that. Yeah, am I wrong? But instead of like eight feet tall, it's only three feet tall. Yeah, still terrifying. The pelican eel has been described by many synonyms, yet nobody has been able to demonstrate that more than one species of pelican eel exists. Riding solo, huh? That's creepy. One of a kind kind of deal. It's also commonly known as the gulper eel or umbrella mouth gulper eel due to its terrifying size and function of its mouth. The mouth and jaws resemble a pelican's gulp, hence the name. The morphology of the pelican eel can be difficult to describe because they're so fragile and oddly shaped that they become damaged when they're pulled out of the deep sea's immense pressure. We can't just swim all the way down there and take pictures, you know? The pelican eel's most notable feature, its mouth, which is much, much larger than its body, like five times the size. The mouth is loosely hinged and can be opened wide enough to swallow a fish three times its size. This thing has like a lower mandible of a python, just like unhinging it before dinner. The lower jaw is hinged at the base of the head with no body mass behind it, making the head look abysmally huge. It's basically a swimming mouth with a spine, tail, and I think a brain? Yeah, we don't really know yet. With dot-sized eyes, yeah. It usually is always moving too, rarely stationary. It hunts in some sort of folded state. The pelican eel's mouth has the capability to change to an inflated shape when hunting, giving the mouth its notably massive appearance. Dude, the mouth unfolds like the James Webb telescope. Like a hundred working parts. Technically, it's like a geometric shape unfolding 
as a mouth, followed by stretching, like a cootie catcher. Remember those? This thing eats like a cootie catcher. When the pelican eel is in pursuit of its prey, it slowly starts unfolding itself. Imagine this thing's trucking behind you, unhinging its jaw, slowly the closer it gets. The head and jaw structure unfold and spread horizontally, not vertically. Okay, that's scarier all of a sudden. The unspreading event, or as I like to call it, lunch, is followed by the inflation of the mouth from a stretchable skin of the head, which it feeds on prey. Then, water is expelled via the gills. Okay, so it's basically a large strainer, and after it eats, it blows itself out, releases all the water back into the water. Just rings itself out. Come on, this thing is horrifying. Thank gosh it only eats crustaceans and creepy little crawlies on the bottom seafloor. And number one, the phantom jellyfish. Stygio medusa gigantea. I love that word. Commonly known as the giant phantom jellyfish, is a part of the monotypic genus of deep sea jellyfish. Stygio medusa. With only around 110 sightings in 110 years, it's a jellyfish that is rarely seen. Well, I guess like once a year. I don't know, I'm not really good at math. Believed to be widespread throughout the world, it thrives in all oceans and seas, with the exception of the Arctic Ocean. Yeah, a little too cold for it. The Monterey Bay Aquarium remotely operated underwater vehicles have only sighted the beast 27 times in 27 years. Dude, what's with all the matching numbers? Is this a CIA run? A study conducted by the Journal of the Marine Biological Association of the UK revealed info regarding the species and had this to say. The Gigantia is thought to be one of the largest invertebrate predators on this planet. Planet. One more time please. The largest predator. It is commonly found in the ocean's midnight zone, reaching depths of about 7,000 meters. Deepest human free dive is about 300 meters. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're good. Unless you have a wide lung span. The largest predators in the deep sea, the giant phantom jellyfish's typical prey consists of plankton and small fish. The S. gigantia tends to be dominant in locations with a low productivity system, meaning it deters other predators of fish. Like, it likes it quiet. A shy eater, I'd say. However, when this thing is hungry, it battles squids, eels, and even whales. Okay, never mind. Just when I thought this thing was really cute, it fights off whales for food. The first specimen weighing in at 100 pounds was collected in 1899, but it wasn't recognized as its own species until 1959. Imagine this thing chasing you and catching you, tangling you in like 100 feet of netting tentacles so it can just eat you slowly. Does this thing have a consciousness? Like, you can kind of tell if a shark is swimming near or close to you or what it's kind of feeling. This thing just slowly, softly swimming towards you before it ingests you? Way scarier. Like, I'm convinced these landed here. The oceans are way scarier than things on land. We haven't even started to uncover the whole ecosystem yet. Number five, goblin shark. Under the sea is where nature starts to really let its creative juices flow. It's just an abstract world of tentacles, feelers, and razor sharp teeth down there. Like a Jackson Pollock, but for things that'll bite you. I know that little crab said it's better down where it's wetter, but I just don't know if I agree if things like the goblin shark are swimming around freely. I know that sounds kind of like I have a strong opinion about these things, and I do. The goblin shark is probably one of the scariest looking living creatures on the planet. The translucent skin really isn't helping matters. I mean, seriously. Google, try and find a cute photo of one of these things, even a little baby. Every single picture of it makes it look like something H.R. Giger would look at and think, hmm, maybe tone it down a bit. The goblin shark gets its name from its grotesque appearance. Sorry to all our goblin shark viewers, it's nothing personal. Its elongated nose and its unique unhinged jaws full of nail-like teeth. That nose isn't just for show either. It actually serves as a little prey detector for the goblin shark. The nose is filled with electroreceptors that allow it to pick up tiny electric fields of prey. It sneaks around the seabed using that little food finder to sniff out its next meal. Electrically charged tracking sharks with monstrous teeth. Wasn't that literally a joke in one of the Austin Powers movies? Goblin sharks actually can't even close their mouths fully with their teeth always being visible just to let you know what they're packing. I think as a general rule of thumb, you should stay away from any creature scientifically named after a goblin. That's advice that has done me well, that's advice that has served Spider-Man well, and I am passing that on to you. Having a good time so far? It would really make my day if you tossed a little old subscribe our way. Number four, the Pacific Black Dragon. Now, this is an entry I could probably include solely on a name basis. You wouldn't even need to see a picture of it, and you just trust that the Pacific Black Dragon is a scary looking fish. However, I'm a visual learner, and you're watching a YouTube video, 
So we're going to include several pictures of one of Mother Nature's most precious little abhorrent monstrosities. Take a look at this thing. You would be forgiven for thinking that this thing popped out of that one guy's chest in Alien because it looks way more like a chest burster than it does a fish. And for those keeping track at home, that's my second reference to the 1979 sci-fi classic and it probably won't be the last in this video. This angry little noodle, occasionally referred to as the Black Sea Dragon, gets its name from the fact that its skin absorbs 99.95% of the light in its habitat, which happens to be anywhere from 1600,000 feet to 6,000 feet below the depths. Meaning this thing is dark. It hides in plain sight in the pitch black water, letting the bait hanging from its chin attract prey. Smaller fish swim up to what they think is something appetizing. And then the last thing they ever see is two beady little glowing eyes and then nothing. While this little fish is one of the smallest monsters on our list, I don't trust a fish that learned how to fish. There's something traitorous about that behavior. And honestly, maybe it's shallow, but I just can't move on from how truly horrifying this thing looks. I'm vapid, I can admit that. And I would love to see the Megalodon snarf this thing up. Number three, Japanese spider crab. How do spiders manage to get into everything? Doesn't matter where you are, you will find a spider crawling around in your apartment, up your shower, on your walls, on the toilet seat. I thought we would have been safe at least in the ocean, but I really should have known better. Introducing the Japanese spider crab, a creature pulled directly from my nightmares in my therapy sessions. These things look like they crawled out of the dankest depths and can grow up to 12 feet long. They can grow up to be 40 pounds, and if somehow one of its many legs gets severed, they can just regrow those no problem when they molt next. They're not just one of the longest crabs in the world, they also have possibly the longest lifespan of any crab, with a spider crab living to up to 100 years old. You're telling me there's a crabby long legs walking around out there who was born in the 20s, still kicking about on the ocean floor? moving his little bowler hat, spinning his little crabby cane. Now a little bit of cursory digging taught me two things about the spider crab to put my fears on ice. Apparently these monsters, despite their outward appearance, are completely benevolent and are more content to scavenge around the ocean floor looking for scraps than they are ever likely to interact with a human and are actually considered to be quite lazy by crab standards. Apparently they taste amazing and are considered a delicacy in some parts of Japan. I know for me, a key part of exposure therapy and getting over any of my fears is to eat my fears slathered in a buttery reduction, uh, prepared over rice, maybe with a nice soy sauce. I'm looking at more pictures and maybe I was totally wrong about the Japanese spider crab. I'm also very tall in a way that concerns people and I'm very lazy, usually scavenging for my next meal as well. Although I am hoping that my next meal is a spider crab sushi combo. Number two, stargazer. The stargazer is a fish that's got a face only a mother nature could love. And even then, it looks like she might not be that generous. This thing kind of looks like if you buried a pug up to its face and then left it out in the sun for a few months. I don't think it's even too much of a stretch to say this might very well be the ugliest fish on the planet. Now, it's not a crime to be the ugliest fish on the planet, and you certainly wouldn't make a list of terrifying creatures just for being a little bit ugly. The stargazer earned its place on this list for also being one of the meanest fishes out there. Oh, it's always the ones you least expect. The stargazer has defensive capabilities that make it sound a lot more like it's a Pokemon than a fish. These things will bury themselves in the ocean floor, turning themselves into a little trap and then using their massive mouths as a vacuum and sucking their unsuspecting prey right up. And if that wasn't enough of an evolutionary selling point for you, the stargazer also has electric organs at the top of it, which transmit electric shocks to predators. That's a nasty little guy. And the name stargazer comes from the fact that when it's burrowing, it buries itself down, and the only thing peering out is its ugly little eyes peering upwards at the sky or the stars. I gotta say, I got absolutely no love for these things. I like that they're very ugly, that's charming, but the rest of it, no. They're like scaly little zappy landmines. Number one, Portuguese man o' war. Of all the things on this list, the Portuguese man o' war seems like it's the most not from this planet. It looks beautifully ethereal, like something you'd see floating around in the background in a Star Wars planet or maybe hanging out with the blue things from Avatar. It's a truly cosmic looking wonder of nature. However, it is anything but. The first clue should be the fact that it is named after a 17th century battleship. It looks a bit like a jellyfish, but in actuality, it's a strange little colonial organism made up of smaller organisms called zooids. See, th this already sounds like I'm talking about an alien, a zooid. 
You gonna look me in the eyes and tell me a zooid is real? This thing actually isn't even an animal, per se, but three organisms in a trench coat trying to sneak into the movies. The main zooid is a gas-filled translucent sack, which coincidentally is uh, what my 10th grade gym teacher used to call me to motivate me to run around the track faster. The gas-filled sack allows the colony to float. The man of war has no means of movement, instead having to rely on the currents of the ocean to direct it around. Real go-with-the-flow type of an organism. Not a bad attitude, to be honest. Now the next zooid, oh, <laughs> I am never gonna get used to saying that are the tentacles, which are really the star of the show here. The tentacles on a man of war reach lengths of up to 165 feet. Now I'll run that by you in case you heard that, fainted, and didn't quite catch what I said. Get up off the floor. Their tentacles can get up to 165 feet long. That's really long. The tentacles, which mind you, carry a sting like a jellyfish's. It's been known to cause paralysis, is enough to kill a fish, and has been on some occasions enough to be lethal to humans. One Redditor recounts a painful story of a vacation to Cuba, strolling a beach and seeing what they thought was a plastic bag floating in the water. They then went to pick it up, and as they described, the next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital in a vinegar bath with a morphine drip, a team of doctors extracting the tentacles that were stuck into my hand. That's enough to keep me away from the water for a bit and maybe uh, prevent myself from ever doing a good deed, try to pick up some litter. I feel like even the Megalodon might want to be careful around this strange monster. 